Welcome to the Startup Grind. Jake, welcome. Welcome to Startup Grind, Musk Team. Uh, our guest tonight is Jake Hoekstra, founder of Hoekstra Masonry in Wilton, right? Correct. So uh, we started this in 2009, is that right? Yep. Okay, cool. All right, so, um, and of course, I asked Tracy to send you questions. Yep, I'm well prepared. Yep. You send you questions, yep. you read them and are all prepared. Oh, yeah. Liar. Nobody, nobody reads them. Well, I read them. Okay. All right, so, so what was your, as a kid, we all do lemonade stands. Did you grow up in Wilton? Yep. Okay, so what was your lemonade stand as a kid in Wilton? Well, I grew up next to a, a, a produce stand, basically, at Garrison's Market, okay. and they also grew things behind there. Yep. Well, when I was a kid, I would run around there all the time and, and do things. Well, I saw a bunch of uh, zucchini planted there in the back, so I, I picked it myself from Garrison's and went door to door selling the zucchini and you know at a reduced price from what Garrison's was until they found out that I was selling their zucchini door to door in Wilton. How'd that work out? Uh, it didn't work out very well. She made me clean up all the zucchini and then she she sold it herself but um, but no really my I'd say my first lemonade stand was a little bit more serious. It was probably when I was 16 or 17 years old. I, I uh, started doing side jobs masonry. I worked for a mason here in, in Muscatine named Tom Haunts. He taught me a lot and I thought, you know, I'm gonna go out and try to do this deal myself, you know, and it was it was rough. Yeah, so as a teenager you started yeah. doing your, your own business. Mm -hmm. as Correct, a yep. Cool. It, um, so can you remember one of the first projects that you ever did? I do remember the first project I ever did. It went really good. The profits weren't very well, but it went pretty well. You know, I mean, it was, I did a good job and it was actually for Garrison's, my okay. next door neighbor. And uh, I- She'd gotten over the zucchini. She'd gotten over it and I poured a concrete slab for her and it went good. I mean, I didn't make a lot of money, but it was a good experience, you know? So it's kind of my first side job, I cool. guess. So, okay, so, so from that experience, I mean, as you said, you're kind of your first lemonade stand. Mm -hmm. um, what lessons from that experience did you learn or do you still use today? You know, I remember Richard Garrison, he's passed away right now. He told me after I did that, he gave me my check and he told me, you know, make sure you save part of this to put towards equipment and make, you know, it was 300 bucks or something yeah. like that, which there wasn't a whole lot left over. But he, I remember him telling me, he said, and always when you ever do anything, keep it legit. He said, pay your taxes, keep everything legit. So. 300 bucks as a 16 year old kid of course I didn't pay my taxes and keep it legit but it it kind of got me in that thinking I still remember him telling it to me you yeah. know yeah. so that was a big and I learned that I didn't know as much about concrete as I thought I did you know that was another hard lesson to learn I guess yeah. but that's, well that's good yeah okay so so I know when we were when we were prepping for this um, kind of in, in your bio and one of the things as you as you have as you launched your business that you have now, Hoekstra Masonry, and as you've grown it, um, uh, you've been able to do so without a lot of bank loans and financing. Correct. We, I mean, I try to keep cash leveraged on everything. Um, it seems like that if, you know, the higher overhead you have, um, the the harder it is to make that because that's an every every day every month every minute thing that you have to be paying so um i've kind of tried to buy things as i go um and we've done a pretty good job of that of staying i mean staying out of debt on payroll end staying out of debt on the you know machinery end and things like that um that's been really important i think so okay so tell us a little bit about the company today okay um, how many guys do you have working for you? How many people? Right now I have nine guys working for okay. me. Yep. Um, what kinds of projects do you do? We do everything from a sidewalk patch to a, a big commercial job to an industrial job. You know, yesterday we were over in Hennepin, Illinois, and we did a uh, explosion-proof wall um, in an ethanol plant. So just kind of anything and everything. What goes into that, an explosion-proof wall? Just a lot of block and a lot of grout and a lot of All rebar. Right. All right, so, a lot of rebar. Yep, yep. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So I know 
um, was a question I had kind of later down the list, but but um, um, I think it's a, it's a good question. Good. Um, I'm curious how uh, s s small business out of uh, small town Wilton, um, you're doing work throughout the Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get to that point? Maybe maybe from starting out, kind of the, the journey of Hoekstra Masonry. Um, I guess, you know, we started doing work for people around here, and some of those were out-of-town firms, and they would ask us, you know, will you will you move? Will you uh, work over here? Will you work over there? And, and you know, about six years ago, it was like my second year in business, um, Manat's Concrete invited me up to the, the racetrack um, to watch a race up there and I got to sit and I got to talk to Tony Manat and he is I mean a major player in the concrete industry and then the trucking is I mean they're they're well known and I asked him I said I mean I thought man I'm gonna get something out of this and I said if you could give me any piece of advice to start my business what would you give me and he told me stay out of a competitive market and at the time I thought that's kind of vague but then I learned that over time that to stay out of a competitive market, you might have to travel somewhere where that market isn't as competitive, you know? So you can actually charge what you need to get for the job to pay your guys, to grow your business and do things like that. Yeah, so I, I can imagine if you're, um, for example, going going east into more of the Chicago market, there's gonna be lots and lots and lots of guys mm -hmm. doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. So your, your price has got to be Mm -hmm. Sharp pencil and yep. Uh, so, so what kind of competition do you have around here, and what do you think about competition? Um, I think competition is good as long as it doesn't drive prices down. Okay. Um, I've never been one to lower my prices to compete with somebody else. We try to have our product be the what we compete with other people with, um, because I figured out that once you start lowering your price to compete with somebody else, then something's got to give. You know. So that's, I don't think competition is a bad thing, as long as it's done the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's changed in the industry since <laughs> your, your, first, your first gig at 16 for Mr. Garrison? The biggest thing that changed in my industry, and you'll probably think this is silly, is a cell phone. Really? Yep, okay. by far. That's the biggest thing that so is. So how so? What's, what's that done to change the it's, industry? It's made us so much more flexible as far as what we can do and how we can run jobs and I mean everything. It changed it changed every aspect of what we do. Things are done so much faster now, so much more efficient, so much more on the fly, more flexible. I mean it's you know, before how could I communicate with somebody who's even two miles away on another job site when I would have to get in my truck and drive over there, there were no cell phones. And you know, I remember when I worked for Tom, we would order concrete. He would order concrete the day before and called in first thing in the morning and say, yeah, we're going to pour today or no, we're not going to pour depending on rain or whatever. Now we can, we can call up to the very last minute and cancel a load and, and really offers a lot of flexibility. So I, I think that's been the biggest thing by far. Yeah, that, that's cool. I mean, I, I would have expected um, technological changes in, in you know, concrete and masonry is one of the oldest professions in the world. I mean, they were building things like we build thousands and you know thousands of years ago. They were masons. Yeah. So, you know, I would definitely say that's. I mean, it's it's huge. Yeah. Cool. How do? You, what do you do to to promote your business, to grow your business, to get new customers? What? Are, uh, we take almost every job. I think that's a big deal because somebody who offers you a sidewalk patch today might offer you a driveway tomorrow and and they might tell their friend who has 100,000 brick to lay that, hey, this guy came and did our sidewalk patch and did a great job. So I think that's that's really good advertising. Um, my wife actually does lots of my advertising stuff for me. She deals with a lot of those things with the paper and she runs a lot of that stuff. And it, it works out well. Good, good. Um, all right. Okay, so from a, from a, um, let's, let's go here. Um, saw in your bio, uh, member of the 
National Federation of Independent Businesses, Wilton Chamber of Commerce, local chambers of commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, for a, being in the construction business, um, I mean, it, it's a broad category, but it's, but it's a very specific, specific trade sort of thing. How do, how does being involved with those kinds of organizations help your business? Um, I'm involved with NFIB just because I think they fight for a lot of things that we stand up for and that we need to, to address in our, in our industry and in every industry, um, as far as small business owners or big business owners. Um, and the Chamber of Commerce, you know, I like to help out and, you know, helping out in my own town is a big thing for me. So, um, it's not so much it helps my business as much as it, you know, is a positive thing for everybody, yeah, I guess. Being a good citizen. Yep. Citizen. So what kind of things, NFIB, do they, do they fight for that, that you're thinking about? Hmm. There's a lot of different things. Um, they kind of fought for us on this whole, um, you know, something was just passed as far as with this dust control, um, which there needed to be some things done with the dust control, but um, OSHA painted it with such a wide brush that it's almost impossible to become compliant with it. So um, they kind of fought for us to try to get some of that stuff under control, like, hey, this is what you are to be compliant. This isn't what you are, because nobody really knows. Yeah. Um, taxes is a major thing, you know. Um, tax reform, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that they try to keep. I mean, taxes is one of the biggest, I would say, issues is of owning your own business. Yeah, so so we're talking about, we're sitting here now, uh, the week of Thanksgiving, and Saturday is always the, the small business Saturday. Mm -hmm. and, and typically it's presented as, you know, a, a retail shopping mm -hmm. alternative. Um, but as the thing is promoted, it's said, you know, all small businesses um, can capitalize on this. So, so you, you mentioned taxes being, being an issue for small businesses. Mm -hmm. What are other um, either obstacles or advantages that you see in owning a small business? There's a lot of, I mean... If you own a small business or any business, I mean, when you wake up in the morning, that business is there no matter what. I mean, it's it's there when you go to bed at night. It's there when you wake up in the morning. It's always on your mind. As soon as I wake up, that fuse is lit and I'm, I'm going. Um, so, you know, when you work for somebody else, when you leave work, you go home and that's, that's it. Um, when you work for yourself, you never leave work, you know, which... I'd say that's one of the disadvantages. So you have to figure out a way to have a life and still have your business. I mean, as far as kids, a wife, friends, a lot of things. Um, but I'd say one of the advantages is um, just satisfaction of getting things done. Um, it allows you some freedom, but not as much freedom as a lot of people I think would think and allow themselves as small business owners. Um, and then, I mean, you meet a lot of different people. Uh, you get to meet employees that are great. You, you know, there's there's a lot of advantages to it. You're talking about the um, flexibility. Uh, some of you guys might have heard this before, but you know, the, if if you own your own, if you own your business, you're you're gonna have to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Yeah. 90 hours a week. Yeah. The good news is you get to pick which 80 hours a week. You're you're right. Uh, at, at times, and there's a lot of times though. I mean, there's a lot of afternoons. You get done work at 4.30, 5 o'clock. You get done doing your physical work. And then you have something else you got to go on. And you know that, hey, when I get home, I got book work to do. I have bids to get out. I have emails to answer. You know, last yesterday I said I mentioned I went to Hennepin, Illinois. You know, I, I left from my shop at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, we left Hennepin at about 4.30. It was an hour and a half drive back. And I had my son's wrestling practice. And then when I got home, I sat down at the computer and I took care of my things. And it is not something you want to do. I mean, you get there and you think, man, I just wish I could just go to bed or maybe I'll just take tonight off. And it's really easy to do that if you're not careful. You know? yeah. So how do you overcome the, the temptation? What drives you to? I think any small business owner, I think there's a couple things that drive them. I think fear drives you a little bit, fear of failure. I mean, I think that's really... 
a big driving factor. I think um, the promise of success, you know, drives you. I mean, my workers drive me a lot too. I mean, sometimes, I mean, if I don't take care of my end of the pro, you know, the process, then they can't take care of their end of the process. And you know, if you have employees and you have, there's, they depend on you to get things done. You know, you can't, you can't go into it kind of willy nilly. You know, things have to be. So, so if you're talking about fear of failure, what's What's the greatest fear? I mean, I think of any business owner, there's a lot of fears, but I think, I mean, oh, there's a million that go through your head every day. You know, you have a bad day, you think to yourself, well, what if tomorrow's bad too? Or what if next week's bad too? Or what if the weather is bad? Or, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you think about. So if, so if there's a bad day and the weather's bad and you can't get any work done for several days um what's what's the one big looming fear not getting meeting your deadlines and getting things done for people when they're when you're supposed to be done because even though you own your own business there's a lot of people that are your boss you know i mean if you let uh, i have a lot of big builders we work for and if you let them down and you don't take care of your end of the bargain well that has a trickle down effect down the line down the line and they don't you know, they don't call you back. No, they don't call you back because there's a lot of people who want to be in your position. Yeah. You know, if somebody else, if you don't take care of them, somebody else will. You know, and they don't want to hear excuses about weather or things like that. You just so aside from doing a good job of, of the work, mm -hmm. um, what's the key to taking care of your customers? Not giving them any excuses. They don't want to hear any excuses. You know, if things don't go well. They don't want to hear why it didn't go well. We just tell them it didn't go well and that you're going to take care of it. Because, in, in the law, I mean, contractors don't want to hear excuses. Homeowners don't want to hear excuses. It's just they want to hear it to be taken care of. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so so let's talk a little bit about um, this this whole thing I call a startup community in, in the Muscatine area. You know, we do this startup grind event. Uh, we've got the, the programs at the college, um, trying to teach entrepreneurship, trying to help motivate other people, inspire other people to mm -hmm. start businesses. Um, what kinds of things do you see uh, we have in this area that that are good for people to to the, if they have an idea to go start something? Um, you mean to help? Cultivate their ideas, or I well, mean, to cultivate ideas to the point where they they launch a business, they start a business, and try to grow it. Um, I think one of the biggest pluses about starting a business in this area is our workforce. I mean, Midwest people and people in this area they're hard workers, you know, and they want to work, and and for the most part they want to show up to work on time, and they've just they've grown up like that, and I don't think there's anywhere else, you know, maybe. In the United States, I mean, that, that is like that. You know, we just got that hard, hard nose, grinded out kind of attitude, and I think that's yeah. really important. Yeah. I saw a thing online this week about, um, and, and it kind of goes to the uh, Mike Rowe and the dirty jobs thing, you know. A lot mm -hmm. of, a lot of uh, uh, I, I read an article talking about we need more trade school programs and, and less you know, four-year college degrees. I mean, I teach at a college. Mm -hmm. um, I have I have the degrees, but but I'm in that school of thought. I think it's important that I mean we're we're losing sight of trades. Um, and a couple of people had had replied, posted to that. It's like, well, people don't like to get dirty anymore. They don't like to sweat anymore. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to young people that that you know, e even if they're thinking about going to college because they say, oh, I don't want to work, I don't want to work that hard. Um, but it's, but it's a good job. It's a good living. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's honest work. I mean, mm -hmm. What do you say to people who, you know, I don't think there's anything like building. I mean, I think that at the end of the day, you can turn around and you can look at what you've done and actually see some visual progress and be proud of something. And you know, there's stuff, there's houses I worked on when I worked for Tom when I was 15, 16 years old that I still drive by and they're still there and they still look great. And there's, 
So I think there's a lot of pride in it, you know. So if you want to take some pride in your work, I think that's a major part of it. And, you know, just when you work in a trade, your job site is different almost every day. Mm -hmm. You know, you're never, you can go to an office and you can sit in the same office every day and stare at the same four walls. Or you can go to a factory and you can get in a line somewhere and stare at the same people in the same. We meet new people every day. We, you know, we, we're in a new situation every day. All the time I think to myself, boy, I never thought I'd be here today at this time. You know, I just, it just happens, you know. So, I mean, you meet a lot of cool people and you get to see a lot of neat things. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's what I love about this whole thing. Startup and entrepreneurship is the variety. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, at, at school, I feel like um, I, I have a new... I have new customers every semester when we start. So mm -hmm. it's kind of cool like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in the area then, how, how can we or, or what do you see that we might be able to do to help advance this idea of, of help people grow, help people bring this entrepreneurial community together and, and uh, support each other to go start something? Um. <sighs> I think just helping people figure out what their plan, I mean, you have to have a plan when you start. So if somebody has an idea, I mean, that's fine, but a lot of people get ideas. Mm -hmm. So just helping them turn that idea into a reality and taking them first, the first, you know, steps forward. And it's, it's scary, you know, when you say, I'm not gonna work for somebody else anymore, I'm just gonna do this myself. I mean, the first, I didn't, I didn't have a paycheck the first, you know, it's not like I had money right there. Yeah. So I think, um, getting them through that first stage of, I mean, where they where it is scary, and they start and they think oh, maybe this isn't for me, and maybe I shouldn't do this. And getting past that's really hard. Yeah. So I think that that would help people a lot. You know, if they had somebody to talk to about things like that. So in, in the in the construction field or or skilled trades, people that that might want to go start something. Mm -hmm. um, how do we go about putting together that sort of, uh, for, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, a uh, uh, you know support group? You know, guys, like-minded people that get together. And say, well, <clears throat> I don't. I mean, like a lot of the builders I talk to, or concrete guys, or excavators, are are my friends. You know, so like last, yesterday, I had a bad day, and you know, it's funny. Every day about five thirty, six o'clock, we all kind of okay. This is what went on today. <coughs> And this is what we have going on tomorrow. Hey, how was your day? Oh, it really sucked. This happened or that happened. Oh, my, you know. And you, you kind of talk it, you know, talk it out. And you think to yourself, because a lot of times I think you think, man, I bet you everybody else is just doing awesome today. You know, everybody else is just kicking ass. Everything's going smooth. And I'm the only one struggling today. But then you talk to other people and you think, you know, they're dealing with the same issues and the same problems that I am. You know, they're dealing with employee issues they're dealing with weather issues they're dealing with all these things too so kind of hearing it from somebody else is big you know and getting them getting them past the the fear stage is big okay cool so so you, you talk about you you you, <coughs> you kind of come together at the end of the end of the day with yep. guys like that i mean do you do you meet up or do you just make phone calls we just talk text? to we, we just talk to each other yeah. back and forth right. you know i mean and they all get where you're coming from and they all understand and that's that's pretty big you know because you know like yesterday was a hard day for me we had we had a bad day yesterday and uh not by the fault of anybody but just just a bad day things didn't go right um on the concrete side of things and i was driving home and uh um, a builder i know that's been in the trade for 30 years had his own business for 30 years in fact he called me and i said man I said, do you ever have those days where you just think, oh man, why do I do this? He goes, oh yeah, it happens all the time. And he goes, I've had some days where I just want to sit down and go, I'm done. I'm writing all this off. But he goes, next day you wake up and you start doing things all over again and you forget about what happened yesterday. And you do, you know. So talking to those people is, is big. Yeah. Um, back when you started, did you have, uh, is there anybody you can point to that was a mentor? I kind of, you know, I worked for a, I didn't work for a whole lot of different people. I worked for a few different builders um, and I kind of took something different from all of them. 
you know, I kind of felt like they all, um, Tom Haunts here in, in Musk team, I mean, he taught me just hard work, just period, hard work, no matter what, you know, nose to the grindstone, head down, mouth shut. That was, you know, we did everything the old way, we did everything the hard way. But then, you know, I worked for a guy named Matt Roosh and he taught me how to deal with people and how to um, get jobs and how to, you know, kind of bend but don't break on some things. And I learned a lot from him too, you know, so kind of a combination of those two at a young age taught me a lot, you know. And even I've had some people who I consider bad employers that have, they've, they've taught me things before, you know. So you kind of learn something from everybody, I guess. Yeah, cool. All right, so so we'll, we'll go to some Q&A here in a little bit. I always like to end my prepared questions with, with a, a two-parter. What's, what's the best part of starting and running your own thing and what's the worst part? Um, the best part would probably be the satisfaction of doing something on your own and having something really bad happen and looking back on it a year later and saying, you know what, I got through that. That's probably one of the best parts of it. Um, and then just seeing how far you've come over the years. Mm -hmm. um, the worst part is probably with your family sometimes. Um, you feel like you never, like I said, I'm, I'm on all the time, you know, like I get calls all the time. I, you know, I'm never shut off. So you kind of, there's times you feel like you're not giving your all um, to people who you should be. And that's probably the worst part. Yeah. But my guess is they got they have your back. Yeah, I mean, my kid. It, I mean, my I have a I have a son who's young, and this summer, I had a bunch of book work too. I got done working. It was like six thirty. It was still light out. I got done with the physical stuff, and I got home, and I had bids that I had to get done that night, and then get emailed out. And he wanted to go fishing. He said, "Dad, can we go fishing?" I said, "No, not right now." Dad, can we go fishing? I said, Jenner, I have a lot of work to do. And he said, Dad, I hate your job. And you think to yourself, oh, man, that hurts, you know. But there's also, I've never missed a single one of his baseball games, never missed a single one of his wrestling practices. I mean, I showed up late last night, but I, I, I don't miss, you know, that's one of the good things, too, is like you said, you can pick those hours. Yeah. Now you're going to pay for it later, yeah. but you can pick the hours. Yeah, cool, cool. All right, who's got questions for Jake? So in a, in a society where education is being put on uh, a pretty high premium, you know, you're someone who you graduate high school and mm -hmm. didn't go into the traditional educational road, and then you start your own business. Obviously, you learned a lot in the trade side and your work experience. What were some challenges on the business side where, where so many people learn some of that stuff in a classroom, you kind of had to learn on the fly? What were some challenges that you had to overcome? Uh -huh. There were a lot. I mean, I had no idea what it took when I started the business. I just knew I wanted, I just knew I had to work hard. That was pretty much all I knew. I mean, um, but the billing end of things, um, the tax end of things, you know, you, you make all this money the first year or that then you figure out the government takes <laughs> this much of it. And you're like, why did I just work so hard for that? You know? So, um, but billing, and taxes, I say, were would be the, and then just dealing with people in general, um, that was kind of a hard thing to learn too. So, but other than that, I mean, it all just kind of comes to you over time, I guess. You know, hard hard lessons to learn sometimes, but it comes to you. Other question I have in this region was so much being a river town and being in an area with so many river towns where there's historical buildings and lots of mason work that has been done in the infrastructure mm -hmm. especially in these old downtowns uh does that actually kind of make this a little bit of a honey hole for someone with your, with your trade set or yes and no um there's money to be made doing those things for sure in fact my best tuck pointer is sitting right there um but there's also some downfalls to it especially with this this dust debate this dust stuff this dust control stuff has become a very expensive thing to get into. And like I said, I mean, the first fine for Moshe is $12,000. Um, and that's that's just right off the bat. And if you don't have a plan after that, it can go to 20,000. And it costs it can cost $20,000 to outfit one crew to do this stuff. And and like I said, OSHA still doesn't really, can't really tell us what we should and shouldn't be doing. But yeah, there, there is a lot of money to be made in it. It's, it's, a, it's a definite, um, 
it's not as good as it should be, but there is some money to be made. What they should be, yes. Um, how hard is it to transition from that historical building to that you know, new construction type project? Um, I think that's one of the best things we're, we do is we're really flexible. We know how to do a lot of different things. So uh, we've never really been able, had to, we've never got pigeonholed on anything, you know. So um, if the new construction, you know, I started my business when the economy was bad. There was not a lot of new construction going on. So we did a lot of historical work and we did a lot of stuff like that and that got me through. And then we st and now that stuff's kind of calming down a little bit, but new construction's coming on. So I don't think you can can just be a one trick pony and, and make it work. But it's it can be it can be hard. So So did people ask you then? So nine years ago. So oh eight? No, right? Oh nine. Yep. Oh nine? Yep. Yeah, at the at the at the right after the the bubble, mm -hmm. did, did people say to you, "What the heck are you doing?" Yeah, kind of. I had one guy tell me who's now out of business. He says, "Ah, oh, you'll never make it go." He said, "If you," but he said, "If you do make it go, right now you'll be able to make it go in the in any economy." And I kind of took that as a challenge a little bit, I guess. Yeah. You know. So I didn't think I'd be here now. I guess and. That's my time, I guess. Cool. Favorite project you've worked on? Ooh. Mm. I don't know. I mean, they all have, they all have their nightmare days, and they all have their really good days. The funnest project I probably ever worked on. Uh, we did a job down in southern Iowa for this guy, and he was kind of a pain in the ass, to be honest with you, but. We got to stay at a really cool place, and we all hung out together together every night. We bought, we got these cabins. My whole crew stayed in all these cabins. And we went fishing every night and grilled out together and hung out. And that was probably my favorite project, you know, because it was kind of like a little vacation and work, you know, and we could all complain about the guy the next day yeah. or that night. It was pretty fun. <laughs> Worst project? Who? Maybe yesterday. I don't know, but. <laughs> um, the worst project I've ever been on, I, I did a pump station or a, um, a floodgate and pump station for the city of Iowa City, and it was a federally funded job. So we had federal inspectors, state inspectors, and it was it was one of those jobs that just grinded out. You know, you thought it was going to take a month. We ended up there three months, but they worked with us on things. But that was the most stressful job and the, the worst job by far. That brings me kind of, I'm sorry to kind of hijack no. Q&A no, session. No. The, uh, this, the aspect of compliance, the aspect of, because mm -hmm. like you mentioned, the dust abatement, these other things with, with structural codes and building codes, how mm -hmm. the IBC is ever evolving. Um, what is that continuing ed process like for yourself and how much training do you have to go through and do you require your guys to have to go through? Um, my guys, we, they don't really go through any training. Um, now I'm always trying to be compliant and I'm always learning new things. Um, a lot of stuff, I believe it or not, I look online and I have some guys that, that, that look up stuff themselves. I mean, like Mike, for instance, um, I remember when we first started doing a lot of tuck pointing, he, he went on YouTube and learned how to do some tuck point stuff. And it, it taught it. I mean, the way we were doing it before was like completely <laughs> slow and not the right way to be doing it. And he went on and saw that. But, um, a lot of stuff comes to, um, you get prints and you get spec books um, for lots of these bigger jobs. I see these spec books and these prints change year after year after year. So you kind of learn as that goes too because then you can call the engineer and say, okay, what are we doing here and how does this work? Do you give much resistance in an industry that uses a lot of organized labor that being- uh, Unions? Yeah. No, not here. We don't get much resistance from that here. I've never had any run-ins with the union. You know. So just, I mean, I think over in Illinois and across the river a little ways, I've, I've heard of some issues, but nothing in Iowa really. And, and that's, a, once again, we don't jump into that market every day, you know, to, enough to be a threat to them, I guess. We jump into it enough to make money when we need to and, and you know, but we're not an everyday player in that market with them, so. That kind of gets to the uh, the competitive market. 
where, yeah. where you play, where you compete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't. A competitive market's a bad place to be, I feel. Yeah, yeah. well, especially if you get that that much competition and some organized labor involved. In, it's like yeah. a whole different ballgame. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, so oh, we do this. Oh, yeah. I, every month I do this. So, so my favorite Steve Jobs quote was, I just want to put a ding in the universe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody's got iPhones and things like that. So... So I like to do this, and uh, my buddy Flynn down at We Can Frame that frames it up for us. So we've just got a nice thank you. So this is to say thanks for sharing your ding. All right, so I appreciate it. All right. Yep. Thanks. Okay.